All right, well, welcome everyone to this iteration of Planetarium Online. I'm Mike Shanahan, the Planetarium Director at Liberty Science Center in New Jersey. And we'd like to thank you all for joining us for our program today. The theme is the search for aliens. We did a separate show on the hunt for planets beyond Earth early on in our series here. And we're kind of looking at the other side of the coin now that we know planets are out there, what are the signs, if any, that life exists elsewhere in the universe, and how do we identify it if it is out there? So during our program, you can go ahead and put your questions in the chat. We do have Andrew standing by answering questions in the chat, and we'll also leave some time when the program is over to address your questions. We will also uh, be talking about the search for life, of course, big, big topic here, as big as it gets. I wanted to mention that we are a nonprofit. We normally do our programming in the giant planetarium at Liberty Science Center in Jersey City, New Jersey, about four miles away from Manhattan. And during this time of closure, we've been able to get permission to use our planetarium software, which is called Digistar, to bring the planetarium right to your home screens. We want to thank Evans and Sutherland, which makes the Digistar software, for making that possible during these times. Also, we are a nonprofit. We're trying really hard to keep our mission going strong over the time of closure. And if you would want to support us in our efforts, there is a donate button there. Again, this is a totally free program. If you want to support Liberty Science Center and the Planetarium, the donate button is the way to give a donation to Liberty Science Center. So thank you again for joining us. And uh, it's been an exciting time in space already this week with more action to come. So we're now going to go ahead and talk just for a couple of minutes about the event that happened this morning, the launch of Perseverance to Mars. And so we're going to go ahead and uh, I'm actually showing you on the screen right now the launch of Curiosity, but it was an identical system, uh, Atlas Centaur rocket that was sent off to the planet Mars. And the launch occurred this morning, picture-perfect launch that occurred at 7.45 in the morning, the very first moment they had to launch in the two-week launch window, conditions were great, and away it went. This is actually the July of Mars. This is the third mission to go to the red planet Mars in this month alone. The United Arab Emirates sent off a mission called HOPE, and the Chinese have launched a mission to Mars as well. And that's because the lineup is really good right now in terms of Earth and Mars. Every two years or so, the lineup is just right to send a mission without having to expend an enormous amount of lift energy. So it's going to take about seven months to get to Mars. And on February 18 at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in 2021, this mission, Perseverance, will land at Jezero Crater, a former lake, now a lake bed on the planet Mars. That'll come up in our show as we talk about Mars. The fact that Mars did have a lot of water once upon a time, and the signs of that are everywhere, including Jezero Crater, where Perseverance is going to land, former lake bed, or former lake, I should say. It is a lake bed. And it also has a river running into it. So it seemed like a really good site, a river flowing into a lake billions of years ago. Probably a lot of interesting sediment, interesting rocks, maybe even signs of microscopic prehistoric life on the planet Mars. So that landing again will happen in mid-February. When you launch at a time like this, it's actually a good lineup in terms of being able to get to Mars pretty quickly in only about seven months or so. Here we actually can see the river, the fossilized river flowing into the crater itself. So the Perseverance will land in the flatlands and then roll up into the hills to do some analysis. So the mission called Perseverance, good title for a launch in these challenging times, uses the basic design of the Curiosity mission that's still functioning at Gale Crater on Mars. But the instruments are new, and that includes a drill that will extract samples from the Martian soil and then bring them back on board uh, Perseverance and save them for a later mission to collect. So that's one of the more fascinating elements of this mission, is that they're going to send another rocket, have it land near Perseverance, go over and collect the samples and bring them back to Earth. That'll be a joint NASA and European Space Agency mission. 
And the exact details of that are not set, but it's really intriguing to have a mission that will involve a second mission to go and collect these samples. About 20 samples will be collected and analyzed for, among other things, signs of life. Also on board is the uh, helicopter that's getting a lot of press. This helicopter will be, in fact, the Ingenuity helicopter, four pound helicopter, big blades to fly in the thin air of the planet Mars, and will be a test, because there's a lot to be said for having a helicopter that can fly away from a rover, scope out the good places to go before you invest weeks or months in directing the rover to a given location near its landing site. So that's being tested out and will be a really intriguing way to help explore Mars. It's the first flying vehicle on any other object in the solar system. So a major step forward. Of course, to be a flying vehicle, you have to have air. And uh, Mars does have a certain amount of air. So that is just an overview, but ties in also very nicely to our search for life in the universe, because Mars has gotten a lot of the focus in terms of looking for life as we look for it in our own neighborhood. So we're now going to go out. Uh, we're going to stay up late tonight. We're going to go up, go out at 2 o'clock in the morning. And we're going to be looking towards the west. Uh, 2 o'clock in the morning tonight, you'll have the waxing gibbous moon just going down. You may have noticed that beautiful moon the last few days. On these hot days, it's looked quite lovely floating there in the sky. And uh, also quite brilliant in the sky, we have the summer triangle. It's in the heart of summer, and the summer triangle is high in the western sky. Three bright stars roped together into a big triangle. But what are you going to really notice besides the moon in the sky this summer are Jupiter and Saturn. They're close. They're about the width of one fist held at arm's length apart from each other. I saw them a couple of days ago. Jupiter blazingly bright. Saturn quite lovely as well. But now let's go past moonset to just before the first light of dawn tomorrow morning. Here we are at about 4.30 in the morning with the moon gone out in the countryside. You get a really beautiful view of the nighttime sky. You can see 3,000 stars on a good, dark, moonless, non-air polluted night. And you can also see the Milky Way, this faint band going across the sky. Often, kids don't see the Milky Way these days so they come to a planetarium because any amount of light blocks it out. But I'm sure most of us have had experiences in our lives going camping, going with the Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts to summer camp, where you've seen a sky this beautiful and full of stars and thought, can there be life out there? Can there be life on other planets in our solar system? Are there planets around other stars, and could they have life? So that idea is not new and clearly is inspired by the beautiful vista of the evening sky. In fact, it goes at least back to the Ro Greek philosopher Epicurus, who uh, is where we get the word Epicurean also. He was a guy who was kind of into luxury and a free thinker, and he postulated back in the third century BC that there could be other planets around other stars and that there could be creatures on those planets. Now that idea became kind of a radical idea by the time we get to the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. So this is Giordano Bruno. He was a Franciscan monk who lived in Rome in the, 15, in the 1500s. And he had a number of ideas that got him into trouble. A lot of them were basic heresy, like denying the virginity of Mary. But he also believed that the planets were other worlds that had beings on them, and that the stars had, other stars had planets that also had life on it. So for his heresies, not so much for his thoughts about the plurality of worlds, Bruno was burned at the stake in the ironically named Campo di Fiore, the field of flowers in Rome that occurred in 1600. You can go to, well not today, but as soon as travel begins going again, you can go to the Campo di Fiore and see this statue of Bruno there in the heart of Rome. So I, I did want to clarify, there's a lot of things. He got turned into a saint for science. He mainly got in trouble with the church for his heretical ideas rather than his ideas that there could be aliens out there. About nine years after that happened, in 1609, Galileo, with his newfangled telescope, turned his telescope on the moon as the very first thing that he looked at. And he discovered amazing things. 
So to put it in context, back in these days, people believed that the moon was a crystalline sphere and believed that everything in the sky was eternal, unchanging, and utterly unlike anything here on Earth. But the moment Galileo turned his telescope on the moon, he saw that idea, which came largely from Aristotle, was totally incorrect. The moon had valleys, it had mountains, it had craters. It appeared to be another world just like planet Earth. And so if the moon is a world, perhaps the other planets are worlds also. And if they are worlds, could there not be life on them? So perhaps not surprisingly, it was actually the moon that got a lot of the attention in the beginning because that was the first place that was obviously another world like the Earth is. And so a little bit of New York pride here. New York had a pretty big role in promoting perhaps the first great hoax about alien life. So basically the sun, which was a newspaper in New York, the sun published six different articles in 1835 about John Herschel. Now John Herschel was the son of someone we talked about earlier in our show. William Herschel, the great German astronomer, discovered Uranus, and his son John became the most famous astronomer of his time. And the son, in this article, series of articles, talked about how John Herschel went to South Africa to install a really high-end, amazing telescope to observe the southern skies. And that much of the articles was 100% correct. Herschel did go down to South Africa and began to finish off charting the southern hemisphere skies. But then the sun took it several steps further. And the sun announced that with his super cool telescope, John Herschel had discovered life on the moon. In fact, he had discovered, according to the articles, a series of bat men and bat women flying around on the moon. So that's one thing to point out is that the, the sun newspaper was talking about Batman long before DC Comics had the idea for a Batman. In their description also, there were unicorns, there were crested birds, many flavors of exotic life on the moon, according to the Sun Moon Hoax. And this is 1835. Uh, John Herschel had nothing to do with the hoax. He was amused by it originally and then got tired because although he had done many great things, he literally invented the idea of the blueprint that we use now for architecture. When folks would meet him, all they wanted to talk about was the moon hoax, even though, again, he had nothing to do with this series of articles about life on the moon. But it probably stirred up the public imagination in terms of thinking about, is there alien life? And could there be life on the moon or maybe somewhere else in our solar system? Well, we realized after a while that the moon's probably not a great place for life because of its lack of air for example, no water. And a lot of our attention was instead focused on Mars as we began to check out the uh, planets in the 19th century. Mars was intriguing. It had clearly dark areas that could be oceans, could be areas of dark rock that change with the seasons. Mar Mars clearly had polar caps like the Earth does. So it was clear by the late 19th century that Mars was definitely the most Earth-like planet. So could it have life? Well, that idea of life on Mars was driven forward by someone we've mentioned twice before in our online programming, my fellow Bostonian Percival Lowell, who moved to Arizona to the Lowell Observatory, built the Lowell Observatory in Arizona to observe Mars. And when Lowell observed Mars, beginning in 1895, he saw that Mars, in his view, had 437 separate canals. And he had a theory. He believed that Mars was the home of an advanced Martian culture, but that Mars was facing a climate catastrophe. The water was drying up, and so the Martians had banded together to build canals to bring water from the polar caps to the equatorial cities in the middle of Mars. Now, in Lowell's view, these were peaceable Martians, and his argument was that these were all straight lines. The canals didn't bend around any national boundaries, so clearly Martians had banded together as a single planet 
to fight the climate disaster and bring water via these canals to their great central cities. Now, most folks never saw canals, didn't believe they existed, but it really got the idea of water-hungry Martians established in the human imagination here around 1895 when, he, when Lowell wrote his first book about Mars. But think about that. Here you have a planet where you're postulating there may be Martians and the planet may be drying up and they may really need water pretty badly. And then all of a sudden, across 45 million miles of space, they learn that there's another planet covered in blue water. And if you think as well that Mars has always meant, going back to mythology, war and aggression, it's not a giant leap to go to the idea of Martian invaders, Martians coming to Earth to steal our water and conquer our lands. And that was the premise behind War of the Worlds, which came out in 1898. So H.G. Wells wrote this novel about Martians coming to London in the original novel, although resettings of the story have been placed in Los Angeles and in New Jersey, local pride there. The Martians uh, are unstoppable. Their war machines and their heat uh, beams destroy every army that's thrown at them. Now, uh, the Martians in War of the Worlds are perhaps the most unsightly of all the various aliens that we've ever imagined in the history of science fiction. So they are squat, octopus-like creatures, and they have a really hard time especially getting around in the heavier gravity of Earth. So if you weigh 100 pounds on, uh, if you weigh 38 pounds on Mars, you weigh 100 pounds on Earth. So these Martians here with their giant bulbous heads and their skinny tentacles had a really hard time getting around themselves, which is why originally in the novel, the Earthling armies thought they would be able to stop the Martians. But then, sure enough, the three-legged war machines pop out of the capsule, and the Martians use that to take over England. And nothing that we toss at the Martians can stop them until they get the common cold. Having not been exposed to germs, the Martians get sick and die when nothing that the human race has can stop them. The germs of Earth do stop them. Now, when I was a grad uh, student at the fantastic University of Washington in Seattle in the 90s, I was actually in the English department, and it was very common there to interpret every piece of literature as being an analogy for colonialism. It got a little bit cliched, but actually War of the Worlds is an analogy about colonialism, and we know that because in the introduction, H.G. Wells says this is an analogy for colonialism. He looked at the disasters, for example, of the English going to places in the South Pacific and the catastrophic impact on the native population. And so he postulated that, well, if Martians came to Earth, maybe it would not go so well either. And this also got the idea going of aliens as being aggressive aliens as being a thing to be feared, uh, as, as is shown, for example, in the classic film called Alien from 1979, which has, along with the Martians in War of the Worlds, perhaps the uh, most unsightly alien in the history of science fiction. Now, this illustration is by Frank Paul, a great illustrator of science fiction from the 30s, and he actually also could be considered, perhaps, one of the first astrobiologists, in that he postulated what would it look like to design an alien to function scientifically in their environment. So back in the 30s already, we knew that Mars was cold, that it had low gravity, and that it had thin air. So look at Frank Paul's alien here and try to see what he designed to create a creature to live in that kind of environment. You may notice among other things, that he has uh, covering on his chest and head, kind of a fur for the cold. For the thin air, he has giant conch-like ears to hear in a very thin atmosphere. That's also to help breathe the thin air, he has a long nose. Perhaps he uses these antennae to communicate uh, telepathically with his fellow Martians. And also in the low gravity, he's grown quite tall, but doesn't need thick legs. So here is an early attempt to try to think about if, if aliens were out there, how would they adapt themselves to live in literally alien environments? And uh, this whole field now, astrobiology, uh, got started in part by early postulations, some of them in, in science fiction, 
for what life might look like elsewhere in the cosmos. So Frank Paul, by the way, didn't stop with Mars. He also designed uh, aliens to live on the planet Venus. Now, we knew less about Venus back in the 30s than they did about Mars back then. They imagined in the 30s that Venus being near the sun would be quite warm. And they also thought that, well, they knew it was cloudy. It was obvious from then that Venus appeared to be covered in clouds. So rain a lot, and they uh, have these otter-like creatures as well with uh, adapted to swim in an amphibious Venusian environment. What I like about this also is that it's kind of evocative of those travel posters to Tahiti or Samoa that uh, you'd see Pan Am producing in the 30s with their flying boat service. So here's a, almost a tourist poster for going to exotic Venus as imagined in the 1930s. And uh, Frank Paul even uh, went on and looked at Mercury and the odds of there being life on Mercury. They knew back then even in the 30s that Mercury was blindingly hot so he designed these kind of insect-like creatures to survive in the horrifically hot environment of Mercury. Notice, by the way, his, uh, these are all really friendly aliens. They're communicating very nicely with our humans, uh, quite different from the War of the Worlds illustration that Frank Paul uh, did for that amazing stories cover. Well, some of the things that Frank Paul postulated are true, and some of them aren't, as we learn more about the planets. So the biggest change has probably been with Venus, we realize now that Venus, quite frankly, is a hellhole. So the clouds trap heat on the surface, as does the very thick atmosphere. So down there on Venus, it's always 861 degrees Fahrenheit. It's hot enough to melt lead. Obviously no water on Venus. The pressure on the surface is like being half a mile down in an earthly ocean. There's no place in the solar system as hostile to life as the planet Venus and I'm sure we'll never go there. Mercury, also uh, blindingly hot on its daytime side, but also Mercury has no air. We know that now, so there's no atmosphere to sustain life. And with no air, no weather, craters that were formed billions of years ago have never been worn away. Daytime high 750, nighttime low minus 250, 1,000 degrees difference between night and day on Mercury. So not an abode of life either. So of the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, Mars does seem to still have the most possibility for some flavor of life. Although as we come to explore Mars more, we have not yet been able to establish that there is, in fact, any kind of life on Mars. Here you see Mars and its two small moons, Phobos and Deimos, which are captured asteroids, we think. But Mars is Earth-like in many ways. It has polar caps that do change with the seasons. Mars does have seasons. It's tilted the same as Earth is. Uh, Mars has a thin atmosphere. It's 100 times as thin as ours, but it is enough to allow for dust storms to get roar roaring across the surface. And it's cold, but probably no colder than a really bad day on Antarctica. The all-time high in Mars was 68 degrees, but really about 100 below zero is more typical on the red planet. But Mars also, once upon a time, was a very different world. And our various missions have shown us that Mars did have flowing water for a long time, did have a thicker atmosphere. And the mission that left today, the Perseverance mission, is going to be checking out Mars for signs of at least microscopic life. Maybe when three billion years ago, Mars was a wetter planet with thicker air, maybe at least microscopic life got going. Now, we have to be careful on that, because something as radical as discovering life elsewhere in the universe needs really great proof. So in 1994, there was a big brouhaha over this. It was a meteorite found in Antarctica. And by analyzing it, we came to realize that it actually did come from the planet Mars. Now, isn't that amazing that things actually occasionally get knocked off of Mars, drift through space, and enter and land on Earth. There are little bits of Mars here on our planet. And by analyzing this, some of this material here seemed to suggest maybe petrified microscopic life on Mars. And so it was actually announced at one time, yay, we found life on Mars. But on further analysis, there's nothing in this sample that could, either not, be, that could not be explained by either chemistry or by contamination after the meteorite struck planet Earth. 
So we haven't proven life on Mars. Uh, the Perseverance mission, though, is targeting to the, it wants to continue on that mission of trying to find whether Mars has the elements for life and whether possibly there could be prehistoric replicas, remains of life that occurred back in the wet days of the planet Mars. But overall, the inner solar system is less and less likely as a abode for life and certainly is completely off the table in terms of being a place where we'd hope to find intelligent life. But one of the themes of our program is that when one door closes, another door opens. And so we're finding places that might include possibilities for life in places we didn't really think about, right? So here we have Enceladus, a 300 mile in diameter moon around the planet Saturn. And when the Cassini mission was at Saturn, just came to an end three years ago, it discovered that Enceladus has an under the crust ocean that goes all the way around the interior of this moon. And on Earth, wherever we find water, we find life. And so who knows, there could maybe be some strange Enceladian fish. By the way, it was jets, ice jets basically coming out of the South Pole of Enceladus that clued us in to the existence of this under the crust ocean. And also places like Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter, and also maybe even Pluto have evidence of under the crust oceans. So all of a sudden, the outer solar system may be more on the table than the inner solar system in terms of possibilities for life being out there. But the fact is, as we begin to think about the possibilities of life out there, uh, certainly in terms of intelligent life, I think we're pretty much convinced there's no chance of finding intelligent life anywhere beyond planet Earth in, this, in our solar system. And so we have to look further afield. And that change to the further afield seems to be something that got going as long ago as 1947 when these flying saucer craves began to hit us. So some hope of finding life in our solar system, still no evidence that alien life does exist in our solar system is the current status. But we're still pursuing that with missions like Perseverance to uh, look for any signs, any evidence of prehistoric, perhaps microscopic life. So, but maybe again, maybe folks were realizing by the 1940s that we had to look further afield than the solar system if we hoped to find life. And certainly, if intelligent life exists beyond Earth, it's going to be around another star. So the flying saucer craze, I love this animation. Thank you, Andrew, for adding the cow to our animation. And the idea of flying saucers or other kinds of unidentified flying objects has been a big part of our culture from a very specific moment in history. So June 24, 1947, was the first report of flying saucers, or actually UFOs. So June 24, a pilot flying near Mount Rainier in Washington State saw nine bright dots flying at what seemed to be supersonic speed in formation. He didn't see flying saucers. Actually, he didn't use that term. But immediately, the term flying saucer got attached to the phenomenon. And within three days of this sighting, in Washington State, in Roswell, New Mexico, reports came in of flying saucers. And by the time 1947 was over, so again, bear in mind, June 24, 1947, the first report. By the end of that year, six, and a half, six months later, there had been 45 reports of flying saucers or other UFOs. So it really became a phenomenon. By the time we hit the 50s, flying saucers were everywhere in our culture. There were great rockabilly songs like Flying Saucer, Rock and Roll and some great and some not so great movies that had to deal with flying saucers coming to Earth either to save us or to harm us. Here's a good example, or a bad example. Flying saucers have invaded our planet. Washington, London, Paris, Moscow are key targets. The whole world is under attack. Can it survive? So flying saucers still uh, become an issue. So uh, in uh, mid, around 2014, 2015, there are reports, sightings off the East Coast from uh, Navy flights of unidentified flying objects that were uh, seen and reported. 
and uh, they actually made the newspaper headlines quite a bit. These videos were released just a few months ago showing some kind of unidentified flying objects uh, here off the East Coast, off of Florida, for example. Again, no actual proof that these are alien beings. They could well be weather balloons, a common explanation for flying saucers. But it's interesting that the issue of unidentified flying objects keeps on coming back. And I mean, there certainly are UFOs, and if there are things that we don't know what they are, there, there are, in fact, unidentified flying objects. The only question is, are they or are they not aliens coming to visit our planet? And there's been no actual 100% proof of that. So uh, looking at the morning sky again, uh, so s again, one theme of our show is some doors close and other doors open. So ruling out the inner solar system as an abode of life beyond Earth, ruling out the entire solar system for having intelligent life. On the other hand, we are, for example, discovering that life thrives on Earth in places we would never have imagined before. At the bottom of the ocean, at vents like this, we found organisms that can live under incredible pressure and deep cold off of minerals coming from these volcanic vents. And so if we know this could happen on Earth, maybe it is possible that such critters could also exist on the oceans of Europa, that moon of Jupiter, or on Enceladus, that moon of Saturn that also has a under the crust ocean. So that's been one development that adds to the chances of finding life is there are really good examples here uh, on Earth of how hardy life is, how life can, on the most extreme set of the circumstances, still find ways to, to prosper. And so another thing that's come along in the last 25 years is that until 25 years ago, we didn't know if there were planets beyond the solar system at all. We had no idea until 1995, no proof that there were planets beyond the sun. And since then, we found over 4,000 extrasolar planets or exoplanets. So here's the sky again that you see before dawn tomorrow morning, and we're marking off every single planet that we found of the 4,100 and plus. So we know nowadays that planets are plentiful, and there's probably as many planets out there as there are stars. There are th probably 200 billion planets out there to go with our 200 billion stars in our galaxy. Even if you cut away the giant planets like Jupiter, which are not great abodes for life, uh, the Earth-like planets would still number in, uh, in the millions. So we know at least that planets are very common, and so that has greatly increased the possibility of finding life because you can't have life on a bla blazing star. You need a planet or a moon to find life. The way we found planets mainly, there's been two main ways that what seem to be absolutely mission impossible. One is to observe a planet wobble as its unseen planet, uh, observe a star wobble as its unseen planet goes around it. Planets are too small to be seen in our telescopes, but we can actually catch the wobbling of a star to tell the existence of the unseen planet. And even more effective uh, in recent years, watching for a planet drift across the face of its star and dr track the drop off in the brightness as this transit occurs. The Kepler mission that came to an end recently used this method to find over 2,000 planets around nearby stars. So with these methods, we've determined that, yes, at least we know planets are very, very, very common, which means the odds of life have gone up exponentially. But it also means that if life exists, intelligent life exists, it's not going to be in any place that we can get to soon, and they probably can't get to us either. So how do we even determine that life exists out there beyond our own solar system? So the idea yet going around 1959 that just as we on Earth are sending radio waves and other forms of uh, electromagnetic radi uh, magnetic radiation into space, alien civilizations might be sending out waves as well. And maybe we can actually uh, pick up on that. So here is uh, Green Bank, the Carolinas. This is a new uh, telescope located there. But at Green Bank in 1960, the very first conference on the search for extraterrestrial life was held. And a couple of famous players in that search were there at that meeting, including a very young Carl Sagan and Frank Drake. And they began to talk about how monitoring the heavens for radio signals or some other kind of, like, say, microwaves coming from a alien civilization might be the only way we have right now to determine if life does exist beyond our own solar system. So this is 
a Frank Drake actually early on tried to monitor two different stars that were uh, close to the Earth. Here is Frank Drake, he's still active. And so he's famous for two things. He tried the first, one of the first monitorings of the heavens, trying to figure out if there were radio signals coming from beyond Earth. And he also came up with the Drake equation, which is trying to figure out what the odds are of them, are there even being life out there, other civilizations that we could communicate with. So uh, this is halfway fanciful and halfway a good tool for trying to figure out what is the likelihood that aliens do exist, aliens that are advanced enough and are communicating enough that we could tell their existence from the signals they send to space. So N here is the number you want. That's what we want. How many alien civilizations exist that we could communicate with? So R star, what is the rate of star formation? How often do stars form in a given, uh, in, uh, in our galaxy? What fraction, FP, what fraction of those stars have planets? That number's gone way up as we realize that planets are really plentiful. Uh, NE, the number of those planets that develop an ecosystem. FL, the number of the fraction of those that develop life. FI, the fraction that develop intelligent life. FC, the fraction of those that have communication techniques. And L, the length of the amount of time that that civilization exists. So using different uh, inputs into this formula get you very different answers. But even back when they first created this, the thought was there could be 50,000 alien civilizations out there that had the technology where we could pick up their existence by listening to signals coming from deep space. And it's probably gone up a little bit now that we know that planets are very, 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 very plentiful in our universe. So this is one of the driving ideas behind SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which has been a system that's monitored the sky for these kind of signs of life beyond our own solar system. So SETI uh, has on many occasions done surveys of the sky. This installation here is their newest one in uh, Hat Creek uh, in California, funded by the Allen Foundation. This one's gonna monitor over a billion stars for signs, radio waves or whatever else, microwaves, indicating there might be intelligent life generating those signals. SETI is sometimes uh, made it into popular culture, the film and the novel Contact, for example. Jodie Foster's uh, character is based on Jill, uh, on a character who actually had dedicated much of her life to the studying of extraterrestrial life. So this search is still going on, and there have been many efforts even to have us use our screensavers on our own computers. Maybe some of you had this on your uh, laptops to monitor w whether or not there's uh, using the downtime on your computer screen to help SETI as it searches the galaxy for any kind of uh, radio waves or other signals from advanced civilizations. So this search has not produced proof positive yet that life does exist in a deep galaxy, but we'll keep on doing it. And sometimes these things do produce really, really fruitful uh, results that aren't part of the original uh, intention of what you're looking for. And so, for example, uh, Joycelyn Bell here, who was uh, in 1967, was doing research in Cambridge, England, a beautiful town. My dad's first sabbatical was spent there. We, my family got to live in that lovely place for a year. She, uh, in 1967, was working at a radio telescope complex in Cambridge, and her job was to study quasars, these newly discovered bursts of energy that we now know are created by these ultra-massive black holes that are at the center of galaxies. And so she was examining a part of the sky with the radio telescope that you can see in the sky tomorrow morning. It's in the summer triangle, in fact. It's a little constellation, kind of hard to see, called Volpecula, otherwise known as the little fox. And she discovered a burst of radiation coming from that part of the sky at a steady pulse. Every 1.3 seconds, a pulse would come from the constellation of Volpecula. So uh, Joycelyn Bell checked out nearby experiments going on within her team to see if there's anything there that had caused that pulse. That wasn't it. They checked the uh, radio telescope to see if there was any errors or any kind of information being fed accidentally. That wasn't 
what was going on. They couldn't figure out what on earth, literally, could be generating this pulse. And so they came to call this, within this Cambridge group, the LGM project, the Little Green Men project, because they were thinking, well, what else could cause a steady pulse but a, ste but a civilization in the direction of Volpecula wanting to communicate with us? So it's called the LGM, or the Little Green Man Initiative, based on these classic characters from science fiction. So that uh, discovery occurred in the summer of 1967. Uh, Joycelyn Bell was about to head back to Northern Ireland, where she lived, for a Christmas break. Decided to go by the uh, office and check out the data coming in for the radio telescopes one last time before she headed off to Northern Ireland for vacation. And she discovered, from another part of the sky, on these graphs, another stutter, another squiggle, similar to the one coming from Volpecula, but from a different part of the sky. This is how they did it, by the way. The system generated 75 feet of graph paper a night from every observation they did. And so she discovered another place that also had steady pulses coming from a whole different part of the sky. So the thinking was, we can't have two alien civilizations simultaneously trying to communicate with us at the same time. So it, there probably has to be a natural interpretation of what's going on. There has to be another reason rather than alien life forms. And in fact, what Joycelyn Bell had discovered was the pulsar. So the pulsar is a star near the end of its life, swells up in a great supernova explosion, collapses down, but pulsars don't have quite, they're not, there's not enough matter in the material to collapse all the way down to be a black hole. So what is left is a really tightly packed together neutron star in the center, about 20 miles in diameter. And as the pulsar rotates, it shoots off a beam of electromagnetic radiation. And sure enough, if you're in the line of that beam, as was Cambridge, England in that observation, you'll get a burst on a very regular repeating basis. In the case of the pulsar in Volpecula, every 1.3 seconds. So it wasn't aliens trying to contact us, although amazingly enough, it led to one of the great discoveries of the last 40 years in astronomy, these amazingly dense neutron stars that spin rapidly and shoot bursts of electromagnetic radiation across the cosmos. So pulsars are really small, by the way. Let me compare a pulsar to the size of the Great Northeast. I love combining geography and astronomy. That's, those two have been together for thousands of years. So let me show you uh, where we are. So our pulsar for scale has been placed over Manhattan right here. So here we have Staten Island. Staten Island is here. Here we have Brooklyn, and then going all the way back here into Long Island. And so here is New Jersey. Here are the long protrusions you see in Hoboken. And right about here is where Liberty State Park is located. And that's also where our planetarium is located. So if, when things go back to semi-normal, if you're visiting wonderful scenic Manhattan, come over the four miles and see our planetarium right there as well, right there across from lower Manhattan. Just ignore the giant pulsar in between us and uh, Manhattan. So yes, yeah, so a great discovery was made, although it had nothing, as it turned out, to do with intelligent life trying to contact us. Now also, uh, speaking of pulsars, so speaking of our attempts to communicate with alien life, the most famous example probably is the gold record that was placed upon uh, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. So the two Voyager missions were launched in 1977, and uh, they put on an actual phonograph type record on each of the two missions so that if aliens are out there and they find this record, and if they somehow figure out from the directions how to build a record player, they would hear sounds of Earth and also see embedded images of our planet Earth. The overall project, by the way, was coordinated by Carl Sagan. And on the record as well, to tell aliens where we live, they put on a diagram showing the 14 nearest pulsars to Earth to identify our exact location in the galaxy, for better or for worse. So there have been a number of science fiction films since then that begin with aliens finding this gold record and coming to find us for better or for worse. Uh, by the way, on the record, uh, there's great music by people like uh, Beethoven, Mozart, and Bach. 
And there's also Johnny Be Good by Chuck Berry is on this record. Uh, one of the great SNL Saturday Night Live routines of all time was Steve Martin in 1978, the year after the launch, playing a psychic who was predicting the week to come. And he said, okay, I predict that aliens are going to contact us because they found the gold record on Voyager, and they're going to send us a four-word message. And that will be, send more Chuck Berry. So who knows if this will ever be found or if they'll ever figure out how to play it. But this is one of our efforts as well to communicate with the greater universe. So we have not found clear-cut evidence that alien life exists. The likelihood is very, very, very good, especially as now we know that there are billions of planets out there. Uh, and so we keep on trying, both looking locally in places like the Perseverance mission to Mars to look for signs of ancient life on Mars and to monitor the skies with uh, experiments like the one that SETI is undertaking now to check billions of stars. So it hasn't happened yet, but uh, it may, and it's an exciting prospect. And sometimes the voyage itself brings out information we didn't know about before, like the discovery, for example, of the pulsar. So that is our program. Again, if you would like to support us, uh, there's a donate button there. And uh, we are uh, trying to keep our mission moving forward as we deal with these challenging times. And I hope we can get over from Manhattan to Liberty Science Center when things do get uh, semi back to normal and visit us in our main planetarium. So with that, I'll go ahead and uh, look at some of the questions before we wrap up our program. All right, so thank you again. I really appreciate the support that people are showing. Yeah, so uh, what is a pulsar? A pulsar is just, so when stars die, it really, what matters is really how much mass the star has in the first place. So really, really, really big stars explode and then collapse down with so much matter still in the collapsing part that nothing can stop their collapse and they turn into being black holes. But if there's not quite enough matter to become a black hole. You get stopped right before the final collapse, and what is left instead is an extremely dense neutron star that as it spins, emits these bursts of radiation that come in pulses, and that is where we got the term pulsar from. When Mars found possible water on Mars, it could mean aliens are real. I mean, the thing about uh, water is that on Earth, wherever water exists, life exists. They have found evidence of an under-the-crust lake on Mars, J just a recent discovery from two years ago. Looking below the crust, they found, just below the surface of the south, you know, the south Pole of Mars, a long but very shallow lake, maybe 10 miles long and two feet deep. So who knows? We haven't found that evidence yet. But where life exists, where water exists on Earth, life exists. So it's certainly something, following the water is certainly something we need to keep on doing. And yes, uh, Akshata is asking, uh, it's possible you might see aliens in the future. That's definitely quite likely. I mean, who knows what's going to happen when that moment occurs when we realize that we have received an incontrovertible signal from an alien civilization. And that was a big debate they had uh, in Cambridge in 1967 when the pulsar was being studied. What if it is coming from an alien civilization? What is our procedure? Should our first step be, do we contact the Prime Minister of Great Britain, or do we write an article for Nature magazine and get famous? Uh, there are interesting protocols in terms of trying to figure out what we would actually do if we turned out that there actually were aliens out there. for other uh, questions we have in the chat here. So uh, Sharisha is wondering if there's alien life out there and they aren't as intelligent as us, what happens if they destroy the golden record? Yeah, that's always a concern. I mean, we don't know. It was really charming to see Frank Paul's illustrations of the friendly Martian and the friendly inhabitant of Mercury. We don't know what that encounter is going to be like. It's, it's much like we had no idea what other planets were going to be like around other stars until we began to find them in 1995. 
we had no examples of other planets besides our own solar system. So when we found other planets, we found things that don't exist in our solar system. We found giant planets, bigger than Jupiter, very close to their stars, closer to their stars than Mercury is to our sun. And so who knows? We only have one example, one place where we see what life is like. Who knows? Life could be so completely different beyond our solar system that who knows if we would even recognize whether it was life uh, when we encountered it. There's many UFO sightings here in New Jersey, and uh, I'd worked in Hawaii before I came here, and those beautiful clear skies of Hawaii, there are many, many unusual phenomena in the skies. Uh, so Cindy's wondering, do pulsars, pulsta, uh, pulsars die like regular stars? No, they don't. So that's the thing about a pulsar, is that a regular sky star kind of dies and well, often evolves into a, a white dwarf star. A pulsar uh, turns into a pulsar and then can live for billions and billions of years as a pulsar. So stars themselves have finite lives. Stars will die sooner or later. But what happens afterwards, whether you turn into a black hole or a white dwarf star or a pulsar, they can live for billions upon billions upon billions of years. So the post-life of a regular star is actually, is probably way, way, way longer than the actual uh, life of the star itself. So uh, Mariella is wondering, Saturn's moon Titan has said that it has bodies of liquid, including rivers and lakes and seas. Is there a possibility of finding life there? It is certainly possible. The challenge of Titan is that it's very, very, very cold. And the, the, the hills and the landscapes of Titan are made of frozen water. That deep in the solar system when it's that cold, water is as hard as rock. And so the lakes are made not of water, but of liquid methane and ethane. So the question is, can life flourish in a place that is so bitterly cold? And again, we may be biased. We have to be careful of our bias towards life as we know it. Maybe there's forms of life that would love being in 300 degree uh, below zero temperatures. But that is one challenge is that it is just so, so cold there on uh, Titan that we have to wonder whether or not it's possible to find life in an environment like that. Pavithra is wondering, what is a black hole? Uh, oh, I wanted to mention, by the way, to everybody that every show that Andrew and I do, and we've done 20 so far, are saved as YouTube videos, and they're all accessible directly off of our LSC in the house page. And so all of these videos we've done, including a show black, about black holes, are all there. You may also, if you're interested in this topic of alien life, check out our exoplanet show, which goes into far more detail on finding exoplanets beyond uh, our solar system. But a black hole is just basically a really big star that at the end of its life blows up in a supernova and then collapses down with so much matter that it, that it collapses down into a, a point whose gravity is so ferocious that not even light can escape from it. So that's another thing that we didn't know existed for sure until the 1960s. But we know now that black holes are everywhere. There's probably billions in our own galaxy, and we also know now for sure that the center of big galaxies almost always have a supermassive black hole. So yeah, definitely check out our black hole show on that because we go into a lot of detail on one of the most favorite topics. We found that basically Mars, alien life, the planets in general, uh, and black holes are among the absolute most popular topics. So pulsars can live almost forever. We have a question from uh, Roshni, pulsars can live virtually to the end of time, which is also the case with black holes and with, uh, with even white dwarf stars. So it is funny that uh, once our stars end their lives, they don't really end. They all have an afterlife, and your afterlife is driven by how big you are. So our sun, at the end of its life in five billion years, will turn into a white dwarf. But that white dwarf is going to probably live longer than our sun did in the 10 billion years it had as a regular star. Yeah, so the sun will swell up, become a red giant first, and then it will collapse down to a white dwarf in approximately five billion years. So Lindsay's wondering, has there been any recent UFO alien activity? A lot of the attention recently has been on those uh, U.S. Uh, Navy sightings off the East Coast, off of Florida, for example, out of Jacksonville, that we showed an example of during our show. And we're getting uh, close to the end of the hour, so I'll check, take a couple of more 
uh, questions here before we rack, uh, wrap up. So the, uh, when our sun dies, what happens when our sun dies? Basically, when it becomes a red giant, it's going to puff off its outer layers of gas. It will go all the way out to the orbit of Earth. So life on Earth will probably come to an end when the sun becomes a red giant in 5 billion years. We'll be inside of the red giant phase of our sun, and then it will collapse down into a black hole. I mean, not a black hole, I'm sorry, into a white dwarf. Do aliens have four eyes? We don't know yet because we haven't seen aliens yet, but certainly we've had a fantastic industry of imagining what alien life would be like, and so that's actually been a real driver. And certainly a lot of folks who got into science were drawn to the scientific field by reading science fiction and thinking about alien life and what it would look like if it existed out there. So that's another side of the whole alien coin is that virtually all science fiction deals with alien life forms and that's been a real inspiration for folks to go on and uh, become scientists and get involved in working for NASA or become astrobiologists. There's a whole field called astrobiology that is predicated on what life would be like beyond our own solar system or even within our solar system, what life would look like. So I'm going to wrap it up there. And uh, again, if you want to support uh, our institution, there's a donate button there. It's the best way to get a hold of us. We'd like to thank you for that. And I hope you can come around and join us next week for our next program in this series. We're going to be doing these shows at 1 o'clock on Thursdays, at least until the end of August. And we're going to have to then see what goes on beyond that in terms of the timing of the opening of our home science center. But thank you so much for joining us. And we hope to see you back here uh, next week on Thursday at 1 o'clock. Thank you again. <laughs>